At the time, it was the uh, New York port of embarkation. They used to call it the Brooklyn Army Base. But no, that operated all through the Second War and the Korean War. And you know, tons of troops and material and equipment were shipped from the Army Base overseas to Europe. And of course, it's, there was a lot of Navy personnel there as well. And it was like any, any neighborhood um, waterfront area that um, there's a lot of violence, just you know, an incredible amount of violence. I think one of the best known characters from your novel is Georgette, who you describe as a hip queer. She's, or he's a, a homosexual, but it, um, often dresses in drag and um, is described as a she in the book. Um, who is the character based on? Well, there was a, a, a young guy named Georgie that lived in the neighborhood, and uh, I didn't understand my relationship to Georgie at the time, but I realized subsequently that I, I had a very deep and profound affection and compassion for Georgie, and in a very real way, Georgie was responsible for my writing the book. I wrote the first part of a section of, of Last Day called The Queen is Dead, I wrote the first part of that story, and, and I called it Love's Labor's Lost, and that was published in the Black Mountain Review. And a year or two later, I met someone from the neighborhood, and they said Georgie had been found dead in the streets, literally in the gutter, and evidently died of an OD. And as I, understand, as I said, I didn't understand the emotions behind this at the time, but I, I knew I had to finish the story. It just, I could not allow Georgie to have died, especially such a humiliating death, without doing something for him. I had to, I had to give him a life, a life of, I had to dignify his life in some way. And I mean dignify, not romanticize. And so I finished his story, and as I was doing that, the concept for the book developed. So in a very real way, Georgie was responsible for my writing last exit to Brooklyn. I, I want to ask you, your nickname is Cubby. Correct. How did you get the name? Well, I'm not sure, but when you have a name like Hubert, <laughs> <laughs> and, you're, <laughs> and you're playing on the streets of Brooklyn with Vinny and Mikey and Tony, and they look at you and say, Hubert, Hubert, you know, you have to do something to survive. And maybe the only reason I survived my childhood was eventually I got to be called Cubby instead of Hubert. So you dropped out of school when you were 15 and you went to work on the waterfront. Why did you drop out? Oh, uh, I, I was as restless, irritable, and discontent. I couldn't stand it. I, I just couldn't stand it. And I also knew I could never succeed in school. It terrified me. I couldn't do it. I had to go. I had to, just had to go. Well, when you were 18, you signed on to a freighter, and that's when you got tuberculosis, right? Well, actually, I, I've been sailing on freighters for a couple of years at oh, that point. I see. I started, I guess I was 15 or 16 the first time I sailed to Europe. And it was just after my 18th birthday when I was taken off the ship in Germany. With tuberculosis? Correct. Uh, if, if I have this straight, the therapy that they used for you, because you were very sick, was... The doctors deflated one lung, took out part of your other lung, mm -hmm. and then removed ten ribs. Why did they remove ten ribs? Well, they, they cut eight ribs out on one side to collapse that lung permanently. And they cut a couple of ribs out on the other side to cut the piece out of the lung. And they had used an experimental drug to keep me alive. And that impaired my vision and my hearing and my inner ear was almost totally destroyed and I couldn't walk. I'd fall down and and all my muscles were petrified from the drug, so it was kind of a mess. You got hooked on morphine from the hospitalization experience after the TB and the surgery? Mm-hmm. Were there any medical precautions that were taken, you know, so that you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't get hooked? Well, you can't prevent it, but, I um, mean, I didn't leave the hospital physically addicted. I just fell in love with the stuff when I got it in the hospital and eventually found it on the streets. How did you kick? Oh, that was really very simple. I got arrested and they strapped me down in solitary and I quit my habit. <laughs> so you kicked in prison? <laughs> Not prison, just a jail, county jail. 
Still must have been pretty excruciating. Well, it was very unpleasant. Was anybody kind to you while you were there? Yeah, nobody was unkind. Yeah, the system, of course, is a drag, but n there was no... Nobody was nasty to me or anything. And, and again, you know, I just kind of have a way of of finding the biggest, strongest murderer and becoming friends with them, and nobody bothers me. Really? Is that the trick? Absolutely. How did you start to write? You dropped out of high school. Well, I don't know if I went to high school. Oh, <laughs> really? Well, I did finish the ninth grade. I guess that's high school. I, My I neighborhood, it was junior high. That, yeah, I know. Um, but anyway, I left at 15. I, I started to write because I, I was taken off a ship in Germany when I was 18. They said I couldn't live more than two months. And I've been given up for dead many times. And I just didn't want to waste my life. I had what I now realize was a spiritual experience. And what happened was I knew that someday I would die. And just before I died, two things would happen. Number one, I would regret my entire life. And number two, I would want to live my life over again and then I would die. And that terrified me. As I say, it was a spiritual experience. And you know, as you know, those experiences are far more profound than any experience we can have at this level of consciousness. And to think that I would live my entire life, look at it, and say, oh, I blew it, was such a terrifying thought that I bought a typewriter. I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but I bought a typewriter, because I had no ideas or anything else. But that is what got me to start writing, was I did not want to waste my life. I wanted to, and I had to do something with my life. Well, writers like Richard Price have credited you with giving them the sense that, that the stories in their neighborhood, that the language that they and their friends used could be the language of literature. What gave you the idea that your stories and the kind of street language that you used or that people around you used could be the stuff of literature? Well, when I started to write, I knew I had to write about something I knew that I couldn't just invent a whole new thing like science fiction or, or whatever. I, I knew that that wasn't my um, area, my shtick. And I was just guided and directed from, again, this inner source, this, you know, this creator of life, whatever it is that exists within all of us. And I, would, I certainly didn't define it as such at the time, but everything else was put out of my mind and my mind only focused on certain things and so every night for the next six years I came home from work and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote some nights I'd get one word some nights two words but every night for six years I worked on this book and that was the only thing that was given to me to write was those experiences well I thank you very much for talking with us well it's been my pleasure thank you Hubert Selby, Jr., recorded in 1990. He died Monday at the age of 75.